In this episode, we're going to talk about buy-sell agreements for partnerships and why it matters. As a certified business valuator, part of the, I'd say 50% of all the valuation work that I do is with regards to shareholder disputes. And the reason that there's usually a shareholder dispute is that the buy-sell agreement is either one, very poorly written, or two, non-existent. So I thought we'd take this episode and talk about some of the basics. We'll talk about valuation methodology, triggering events, i.e. what happens and what triggers an event to buy and sell, mandatory versus voluntary triggering events, uh, purchase and payment options that can be built into a well-written agreement, and then minority rights, or what we call drag-along, tag-along rights associated with the sale of a company. So if you're in a partnership and you don't have a buy-sell agreement, stick around. This video is pretty important. Now we've dedicated this channel to the concept that the more you know, the better decisions that you'll make. So join me as I discuss buying, financing, growing, and selling privately held businesses. If you're a business owner, a first time business buyer, or a trusted advisor, you've come to the right place. So if you enjoy this episode, hit like and subscribe, and let's get started. A well-written purchase and sale agreement will cover three basic topics. And the first is what defines a trigger event. So an event that actually triggers the company or the uh, remaining shareholders purchasing the shares from a departing shareholder or from a shareholder's estate in case there's a death. The second one is really around valuation methodology, clearly describing that valuation methodology that would be applied upon a triggering event. And then third, the payment and purchase of those shares, whether they're dump it, done in a lump sum over a period of time. Triggering events in a purchase and sell agreement are usually divided into two and sometimes three different categories. The first one is mandatory. So the, if a, an event happens, the company has the obligation to purchase the shareholders from a death of a shareholder, uh, termination of employment, or disability of a shareholder. And there could be others, but this is where the corporation has the obligation to purchase those shares back from either the estate or the individual shareholders. The second is voluntary or what's also known as right of first refusal. And this really covers if a shareholder is trying to sell their shares to a third party. The company has the option but not the obligation to match that price and or purchase those shares back. Now this provision can be written a couple different ways and I've given you the one that is where I see is most common. The other thing about voluntary transfer or right of first refusal is if the company decides to pass on the option, the option then falls to the individual shareholders in the company if they'd like to purchase those shares from the departing uh, a shareholder. And then the lastly is involuntary transfer. And we see this, this really covers bankruptcy of a shareholder. So if you have an individual shareholder that's going bankrupt, the company needs to step in and purchase those shares back. And again, this is more under the option of the company as the option, but not the obligation to do it. Um, and if the company passes, 
then it's up to, it falls to the individual shareholders. They can then purchase those shares. So triggering events, three uh, triggering event categories, mandatory, voluntary with a right of first refusal, and an involuntary transfer. The second part of a well-written buy-sell agreement is the definition of the valuation methodology. And there's really three separate uh, methodologies that are most commonly used in a buy-sell agreement. The first is fair market value. Now this is defined by revenue ruling 5960 and is the foundation for modern valuations. Uh, the second is fair value and that's a state statute definition and it varies by state. In the state of Oregon, uh, for example, fair value really equals fair market value with no discounts for lack of control and or lack of marketability. And then finally, there's book value. And book value is simply the difference between the company's assets and the company's liabilities. For most well-run companies that are fairly profitable at, a, say, at least a um, EBITDA of 10% of its revenue, the fair market value or fair value is going to way out exceed the company's book value. So if you have a company that's profitable, uh, could have a value, a fair market value of, say, $10 million, but may have a uh, book value of 1.5. So the question comes down to the shareholders is, and this is a question I always pose uh, clients when I'm talking to them before referring them to an attorney, and that is, um, if you died tomorrow, what value would you want calculated in order to pass on to your spouse and or heirs? 99.9 percent .9 it's fair market value but that fair market value being higher also has some capital constraints or implications to a company so it's a question you really have to think about but 99 percent of the time most of the well-written documents that i've seen have fair market value as far as their valuation methodology now that you have both the triggering events defined as well as the valuation methodology, the next step or next piece of the agreement is really around how that payment uh, would be uh, transferred in event of a triggering event. Most um, agreements or well-written agreements usually give you two options. One, a cash option or two, uh, anywhere from a three to five year term with uh, as, you know market rate interest rate on that note. And that note is uh, secured by the company's balance sheet. A lot of companies, and let's go back to the uh, example where we had a $10 billion valuation on a company and you had a majority shareholder pass. So all of a sudden there's a $5 million capital event for the company to repurchase on a mandatory level the shares from the estate or widow of the, um, uh, the shareholder that passed. A lot of companies, when you get to that type of valuation, will pay for key man life insurance policies so that in that event that, that will offset some of the capital um, that's needed to repurchase those shares. And so it's a good thing to cover that in that agreement. The other item that is also defined are what are called drag along rights. So if a company, uh, the majority of the shareholders agree to sell the company to an outside third party, the minority shareholders or the shareholders that didn't agree to it actually have to actually participate in the sell and sell their shares at the stated price that have been either accepted by the board of directors and or the majority of the shareholders. And that's called tag along, drag along rights. And then lastly, 
Um, most well-written documents that I've seen also have a spousal consent. And this really is for a dissolution of marriage or community property issues with regards to divorce. So uh, again, uh, these three items uh, need to be included in a well-written and well-documented buy-sell agreement. There you have it buy-sell agreement and why it matters to you. And again, the reason that it matters is that it's well-defined and that definition of triggering events, uh, valuation methodology, payment options, drag-along, tag-along, or minority rights, and spousal consent can keep you out of court. And it also is a great document for just all of the partners coming and going throughout the, the period of the life cycle of a, of a business to fully understand what their shareholder rights are. So I hope you got something out of this video and we'll see you in the next episode.